So uh, this is Isaiah's look, uh, at least right away the, uh, uh, in chapter 2. Let me see if I can just highlight some of these and looking at some of the um, 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 headings that here. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13, judgment on the day of the Lord. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. We even have the phrase day of the Lord. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every heart will, human heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will ride like a woman in labor. Notice the language when it talks about labor pains. Uh, reminds me of Matthew chapter 24 and, and Mark 13 and Luke 17, um, where Yeshua is giving his all of it discourse and he talks about um, the, the the birth pangs and things like that. They'll look at one another in astonishment, the faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fire and burning anger. A major theme of the day of the Lord is this fire and burning and this judgment by um, fire and heat and and uh, those types of um, language descriptors. And the reason that's important is because if you recall, when God judged the world in with Noah's flood, it was a judgment by water. The description of the um, judgment on humanity and the destruction of of all the the, the people of the world and the re- pushing the reset button by God, with the exception of Noah and his family, was done through water. And then God promised through the covenant with, that he had with the earth and the sign of the rainbow and the cloud that never again will I flood the earth with water. But God did not promise that he wouldn't judge the earth again. Indeed, because of wickedness that exists that exists in the earth, because of um, wicked humanity rejecting God over and over again, man is headed towards destruction once again. And so God must bring judgment, but this time it will be predominantly with fire. And that's the theme of the jud- of the day of the Lord is the judgment and destruction by fire. And so we're going to see that over and over again when you're reading through the day of the Lord uh, prophecies, fire and burning anger, um, things like that. That whole theme, uh, that that motif, that that symbol of of using burning elements. The the the, the you know the, the 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 even the earth will be burned up. The, the elements will melt. Um, you know the, the 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 sky will be burned up and things like that. The stars of heaven, their light, uh, he will exterminate the sinners from the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. This language should remind you of prophecies from Joel, prophecies that Yeshua picked up on, prophecies the book of Revelation is going to pick up on. Um, the, the, the cosmic lights being turned out because of the day of the Lord's arrival being signaled by the flash of and the brightness of the Lord is coming himself. So remember, this is another theme that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. I can't help but stop and comment. The day of the Lord is signaled by um, these cosmic signs in the heavens, the darkness of the sun and the moon and the stars, so that the brilliance of the Lord's arrival, the parousia, can be observed by not just the wicked, but by the righteous. And so the day of the Lord has this dual theme. Primarily, the theme of the day of the Lord is the destruction of the wicked. But it, before that, it's the rescue of the righteous. And so the, the sign that signals the arrival of the day of the Lord, the parousia of Messiah, right? The coming of the Lord, when I say the parousia, um, some people say parousia or something like that. But uh, I believe the Greek is pronounced parousia. That theme is primarily one of fear and a day that comes like a thief in the night for those who don't know God. And so they're fearful, they're, they're, they're shaking in their boots, and they should be because it's a day of re- reckoning with God himself for the rick- wickedness and, ro- and the ungodliness that mankind has um, been steeped in from since all the way days back. But for those of us who are righteous, it's our day of redemption, it's our day of rescue, it's God um, um, come to vindicate us and to deliver us from the wicked system that is uh, would would seek to destroy us, right, as, as evil always persecutes righteousness. And so, um, we who are righteous, we look forward to the day of the Lord, but those who are wicked, they should not look forward to the day of the Lord. So again, we see these dual themes, these the, the binary qualities of the day of the Lord, both the 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 um the ushering in or the bringing in of the coming of the Lord to rescue us from the persecution from wickedness, right? From the beast systems that that are all around us, like Israel has her Babylons, right? The church has her uh, a wickedness that's all around her and the persecution of the Antichrist that she will have to face in the final days. 
but it's the punishment of the wicked that this day of the Lord um, sign also heralds. And so in verse 11 of Isaiah 13, so I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their wrongdoing. So that's the theme of the day of the Lord. But again, it's this, this um, rescue of the righteous. So I don't want to spend all the time on that one. Judgment on the earth, Isaiah chapter 24. Behold, the, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, twists its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. Notice the universal scope of the judgment of the day of the Lord, which is bigger than punishing just wicked Babylon who exiled Israel in the 4th or 5th or 6th century, right? In 586 BC when she sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Notice, if it's just a judgment on Babylon, why does God have to judge the entire earth? What did they have to do with exiling Israel and carrying her off into captivity? Ah, that's where we need to keep sight of the bigger picture by the prophets. God is utilizing the occurrence of the exile of his people to uh, announce to not just Israel, but announce to the entire world through the prophets here. That judgment is going to be coming upon the entire world and its wicked systems. Remember, wickedness has been in the earth for a lot longer than Israel has existed on the earth. Right? Just remind yourself of that. And that's going to help us understand why when we get to the, to the book of Revelation, why so many of the judgments are universal in scope. Why they're covering large parts of the world or what we might call the earth dwellers, those who dwell on the earth. The, the wicked beast system, the final uh, eighth empire that Satan raises up in the final days, the mark of the beast that he imposes on who? Israel only. Nope. That he imposes on who? Only people in America. No. The mark of the beast is imposed on everyone around the world. You can't buy or sell unless you have the mark, according to uh, Revelation chapter 13. And so um, this mark is going to be universal in the sense that it'll be international. It's something that is a, is a, a, a wickedness that's going to be um, affecting everyone in the world, no matter where you live, great and small, rich and poor. And so for that reason, the idolatrous practices that are um, personified by this, this evil woman, Mystery Babylon, whether she be Jerusalem or the literal rebuilt Babylon, no matter which perspective you take, either way, it's a universal scope. It's got to be larger than just one city per se, even if that one city is maybe the 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 representative of it. The 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 wickedness itself is far uh, more uh, reaching, uh, and that's why we're reading these judgments uh, in the prophets that are on the entire earth. Behold, the the Lord lays the earth waste. Why? It's because wickedness is everywhere right now. But notice that we, as we're skipping through Isaiah, the greatness of God, comfort, comfort my people, says God, speak kindly to Jerusalem, call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her guilt has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Even that word doubling is language that shows up uh, when describing Mystery Babylon, the book of Revelation, leads a lot of people to believe that Mystery Babylon is eschatological Jerusalem because of the word, the phrase is doubling for all her sins. And this is language that only shows up against uh, Israel. It doesn't show up, the word doubling doesn't show up against the wicked nations of the world. But regardless of the language that the, the book of Revelation borrows from the prophets, what we see is that God promises to bring Israel back to a place of redemption, no matter how wicked she gets. God is not going to allow Satan to ultimately dis persecute and destroy Israel so as to leave Messiah with no one to inherit the righteous kingdom. That would mean that Satan would win. You understand what I'm saying? God has to rescue Israel because that's how God keeps good on his promises made to the forefathers. And God vindicates his own righteousness and his own righteous name and establishes his own son's kingdom that was foretold way back in Daniel, uh, as, as early as Daniel chapter um, 7, where the... Um, uh, the, the the son of the one like the son of man approaches the ancient of days and is given a kingdom. Of course, these prophecies go even much further, right? Uh, even way back to the Torah of Moses, where uh, the the scepter of righteousness shall not depart from from uh, Shiloh. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, depart from um, between from Judah until Shiloh comes. So we're talking about prophecies of a coming messianic age, but it's it's ruled by a messianic. Um, descendant of David, right? A messianic uh, uh, a king, a righteous king, but it has to have righteous subjects. And so if Satan is able to not just persecute God's people, right? Israel and uh, genuine Christians, the church. If he's not able to just persecute them, but actually wipe them out, 
well, then there won't be anyone to inherit the kingdom. And so um, that's what he's working towards. He tries and tries and tries using his beast kingdoms to destroy God's people so that there won't be anyone to inherit the kingdom. But God says, no, speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare is in it, that her guilt has been removed. She has received the Lord's hand double for her sins. The voice of one crying out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. This is, of course, the, the voice of Isaiah that John the Baptist picks up and walks in the spirit of, right? The one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the make straight in the desert, uh, we make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So um, these are wonderful passages because they speak of this greater exodus of Israel coming out of the perse- out from under the persecution of Egypt, being supernaturally protected during this time period of a greater exodus that we're going to read about in some of these prophecies, prophecies, if I can get to them. But notice, again, we're in the same book, Isaiah, but we're in chapter 47. There's a mourning for Babylon. Why? Because... Um, Babylon is going to personify the, um, the, 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 the culmination of the wicked world systems. And so um, there's language that shows up in the prophets very early, like I said, we're in Isaiah, that we're going to read about that is borrowed again and repeated almost verbatim in the book of Revelation, particularly like when we get to Jeremiah in the 50s, that helps us understand that God has judged Babylon, yes, for her exiling of Israel in the past, yes, but that was only on the partial fulfillment the final judgment is awaiting because of the language that it talks about indeed babylon went on to survive the the partial judgment uh so much to the point that people uh there are jews who stayed on in babylon that that thrived there was a jewish presence that thrived in babylon even after the exec- exile and even produced are you ready for it the babylonian talmud yeah that's right the babylonian talmud comes from babylon that's the name you know Ta- talmud bavli is the Babylonian Talmud that was that was kind of um, formulated in that day, at least orally, until it was finally codified in the in the first uh, centuries and following. But the point I'm trying to say is that not only did Babylon survive the exile and the punishment that was foretold in these prophets, but currently, like I said, if I Google search it, I'll just put a little graphic on the screen and post that shows that the current um, population of current Babylon, as in um, not it's it's neo Babylon, but it's really now we can think of like um, Saddam Hussein's Babylon, right? Um, the one I, the Iraq Babylon is currently over a million people residing in Babylon today, right? I think it's almost like a million and a half or something like that. I'll put the little graphic on the screen for you. So this morning for Babylon is is describing not just the partial fulfillment of her destruction, but ultimately, if we look at the language carefully, we'll see that there's language that foretells of her future and future and total. A destruction that's that's in the works as well. Um, Isaiah 60, a glorified Zion. Again, Israel is going to find her place where God is going to restore her. So no matter how dark and bleak it gets for Israel in any given age, God's ultimate goal for Israel is restoration, Zion, and establishing his name there. She will not pass away uh, into the trash heaps of history, like some of these other nations eventually will. Eventually, there will be no more Babylon. One day, there will be no more wicked Babylon on the earth because righteousness will reign, the new heavens and the new earth will be recreated, and Babylon will be relegated to the trash heap of history Those of one of those wicked nations that, that opposed God and his Messiah. But not Israel. Jerusalem's name will live on. Indeed, at the very end of the book of Revelation, we have the new Jerusalem. There is no new Babylon that comes down out of heaven, people. There's no new Egypt or no um, new uh, fill-in-the-blank with your favorite wicked city uh, that that rises up anywhere in, in the end, end times. It's only Jerusalem's that name that carries on because God has placed his name there and he has set his affection on that uh, particular uh, part of at least this world. I don't know how the new age is a new earth where new Jerusalem will be parked. Maybe it'll be over ancient Jerusalem or current Jerusalem. Um, maybe it'll be over the North Pole. I'm not sure. Uh, but the point is, the point I'm simply trying to make is, make, bring up is that it's the word Jerusalem. We don't have to imagine that it's going to be some different name. Like some preterists believe that, oh yeah, in the future there will be a, a new Jerusalem, but it won't be called Jerusalem anymore. I think Chris White talks about how that Jerusalem will come back after her destruction in the first in in the end times, he holds to a Jerusalem as eschatological uh, um, mystery Babylon model, uh, but he believes that Jerusalem itself will be renamed, you know, uh, the Lord our righteousness. So she won't even be called Jerusalem anymore. But there are too many other prophecies that 
that uh, counteract that go against what he's trying to say there. So I think he's on shaky ground there. Nevertheless, he's a great Bible teacher, though. Even though I don't fully agree with his um, Jer- Jerusalem view, I do hold to his his um, pre ref view. That's uh, Chris White. All right, so let's wrap this part up. I'm not going to finish this tonight. Um, just just to help you understand, we'll, pick, we'll we'll stretch this out into one more week. We'll pick this up next week um, where we'll start into the book of Jeremiah. Notice I just finished with Isaiah. So this is a great uh, place to stop. But the end of the book of Isaiah, remember we started as I'm bringing this study to a close. We started in Isaiah with Israel being called a prostitute, right? The, she was once faithful, is now playing the harlot, and she is going into destruction and into exile, and Jerusalem will be plowed under or destroyed, uh, set on fire. The temple is going to be sacked, right? The first wicked nation to ever do so, first, first foreign nation, Gentile nation to ever sack Jerusalem is Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar is Babylon. And thus the 70 years of exile began. Daniel was carted off as a teenager in, off into Babylon as well. And so that's the beginning of the book of Isaiah. But just using the book of Isaiah as a snapshot, we can turn and see that all the way here at the end, we're only in chapter 60 and we still got six more chapters, which we're not going to look at in our study, but you can do it on your own. You'll notice that suddenly it's the restoration and the glorification of Zion and Jerusalem and the restoration of God's people unto himself that's in full view with a view towards the the final end time um, new Jerusalem and the thousand year reign of Messiah and then the new Jerusalem after that. All of that is in full view as we get towards the very end of the book. So just using Isaiah, we can say it starts out doomy and gloomy, but it ends in restoration and blessing and uh, God uh, being reconciled to his people like it should be. And why is that? And I'll say this and then I'll close. It's not because of things that Israel is doing. It's not because she's so clever. It's not because she's so, so good looking. It's not because she is so righteous in her deeds. Far from it. Because of her wickedness, she goes off into um, exile and judgment and punishment over and over again. But it's because God is faithful, people. It's because God himself has promised, made promises to the forefathers. And God has promised, uh, swearing on his own uh, on His own name, that he will establish righteousness for himself, that he'll create a name for himself in the earth, that he'll raise up a people for himself, that his son Messiah is going to rule over, that he will give this kingdom to his son, the righteous ruler, the righteous king, the son of man, the son of God, the son of David. That he, God made promises to David that you will never lack a man to sit on your throne, David, even though there will be periods where Israel is going to go out of existence, as it were, there will always be a remnant, God promises, that God will preserve for himself that he can start the fires burning all over again. And eventually this remnant grows into, you know, starts out as a small kind of mustard seed size, but grows into a larger group of people, innumerable, because we know the church has been brought into this uh, people group of Israel, swelling our numbers to, to where it's uncountable. And now the promise is given to Abraham so long ago where the your, your descendants will be like the stars of the sky uncountable and the sand on the seashore uncountable, innumerable, can only be fulfilled with the bringing in of the church or the righteous Gentiles into Israel. It can never really be fulfilled by national Israel standards alone. So it's so important as we're reading through these prophecies to catch the scope of God's people, national Israel, but at the same time, there's a view towards the church who's brought into the people of Israel as part of this establishing of a kingdom that will rule and reign with Messiah here on planet Earth for a thousand years. But in order to get to that point, God has to deal with both the uh, compromising church, wayward, backwards, uh, backsliding, um, um, uh, what do we say, uh, uh, co- compromising, and in some cases, dead church. But at the same time, he has to still deal with national Israel, people who don't know their Messiah. So we're going to work our way towards that. Next week, we'll start right away in with uh, Jeremiah, um, starting in chapter 16. And we'll begin to uh, sort of build a little bit of this, um, what's known as the greater Exodus, because Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23 both have prophecies that talk about, uh, and I'll just kind of give you this little teaser. Um, if we scroll down to verse... Um, let me see, you find it here. God will restore them starting at verse 14 to behold, the days are coming, right? Day of the Lord, um, declares the Lord and will no longer be said as the Lord lives who brought us, brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. 
Verse 15, but as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of evil uh, Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he has banished them. Why? For I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their forefathers, to, to their fathers. So this is what we call the greater Exodus that is that was fulfilled partially by God bringing the people back out of exile uh, in Jeremiah's time, right? Remember, Jeremiah has also lived uh, either pre-exilic or during the exile, prophesied right around that time period. Um, but at the same time, there's a greater Exodus that's kind of coming down the road where God still has to deliver Israel from the um, oppression of all the wickedness that's around her in the future. So we'll begin to uh, unpack that next week, but that'll do it for Eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events.